Okay, we're back. Here it is, uh, Monday afternoon. Whoa, 12 o'clock, and that means every two weeks for Mina, Marco, and me talking about energy. And uh, welcome to the show. Mina, you're here in Honolulu, yeah? I was there last weekend, but I'm back on beautiful Kauai today. Okay, back in, back in Kauai. Uh, and Marco, you're in, the, you're in the Big Island now? Yes, I am, and uh, um, it's just a great way to start my week by being with uh, on the, on the air with two of my favorite energy people, Jay. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> We're having such a good time, a, a good time in energy. I just uh, I want to uh, just report to you that we finished a uh, show just now uh, with the Rain Far Rainforest Action Network, which uh, is present in, at COP21 in Paris, a woman by the name of Amanda Starbuck. And she reported to us on all that's going on in Paris. And it's quite a shindig. And they, uh, you know, they meet every year, but this is the best year ever in terms of getting together and getting agreements from 180 countries. And they seek one basic agreement. And it'll be out probably at the end of the week. And we'll be very interested to see. So um, you know, it was an important discussion. And it, uh, somehow, I think sometimes we forget uh, here in Hawaii, around the world, halfway around the world from her, uh, that um, you know, it's all about climate change, really, in large part. If you want to save the world, it's not about cheap energy bills. Um, it is about climate change, because we're going to have serious problems in our lifetime uh, unless we do deal with it. And their efforts are Herculean, but uh, they're by no means guaranteed. So we have to do what we can do to help them and be part of it. So on that note, uh, I guess let me ask you, uh, was there any discussion of climate change at the PUC hearing? Well, so no, far. Because um, yeah, please, Maria, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, this is an evidentiary hearing, and the commission laid out you know, specific issues to be discussed with regards to the merger. And so... You know, uh, putting climate out, climate change out there out front is is um, in a way off topic. Yeah. Okay. But I mean, we'll talk later in this show about how that might affect the legislative briefing in January, January twenty second, because that is, is yeah. part of the discussion for the state legislature for sure. Well, uh, why don't we talk about what happened at the hearing? Uh, where we are in the proceedings and what's going on because you know it's in the middle of the day and although a lot of people who could get down there to see it um, uh, you know they can't they, they got to work so take us there will you tell us what's going on well I maybe I'll start first I was uh, I was at the hearings uh, Monday Tuesday of last week uh, for um, uh, eco president Alan Oshima was on the stand and then uh, Next year, the next year, uh, field general, so to speak, out here, Eric Gleason was on the stand Wednesday and Thursday. Uh, Friday was an off day, and then uh, Eric is back on the stand uh, today. Uh, it's available to watch for those of us not able to get to the Blaisdell. It's available to watch on uh, Olelo Community TV. All very uh, interesting stuff. If you're interested in energy issues and matters, and uh, I'd say one of my takeaways is that uh, the schedule proposed for these hearings. Uh, which uh, are all week this week, Monday through Friday, and then Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday of next week. Uh, most likely, uh, all the witnesses uh, will not uh, uh, be uh, wrapped up uh, by uh, Wednesday of next week. So I think there's, at this point, there's a very reasonable, if not strong, probability that the hearings will be extended and have to be rescheduled to uh, reconvene to handle the rest of the witnesses and questioning uh, sometime next year, whether that's in January or February. So it's uh, certainly very interesting. I think the Chairman Randy Wasse is doing a, a good job so far in terms of keeping the boat going in the right direction and, and maintaining a tight, uh, a tight ship. And uh, uh, it's kind of interesting to see amongst the 24 interveners kind of who who is receded to the background to some degree and who. Uh, who amongst the 24 are, are front and center stage. There are about 10 or so, 10 of the 24, that are taking a more active role in terms of the questioning of the various witnesses. So uh, I'd say we're well underway, and uh, some interesting stuff is coming out. 
what in, what is coming out? Can you give us a precis of the things that uh, are of interest in this testimony? Well, we're, we're still only have gotten through two witnesses, and actually maybe a witness in three quarters or witness in seven eighths, because because Eric will probably wrap things up today. So uh, I'd say some of the the things that popped up in my mind. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion over potential savings uh, with. Uh, an off-quoted figure now that was developed by, I believe it was County of Hawaii, estimating that really a small pittance uh, of actual savings was going to accrue to each and every rate payer, with uh, Hawaiian Electric and next year responding, well, $60 million in savings is $60 million in savings, and uh, they, 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 they're standing behind that being a substantial number. Uh, I mean, we're, we're only two or so witnesses into a, a grand total of possibly 17, 17 witnesses coming from the applicants, the applicants being Hawaiian Electric Companies and then uh, next era. So it, we're still kind of in the, in the prologue, I think, to some extent, and there's going to be a lot more uh, meat uh, or tofu put on the bones as, uh, as some of the, 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 the heavy hitters come, uh, come in the days to come. What's the, t what's the tenor of the questions? I mean, the, the, the spirit of the discussion, I mean, is it, uh, are these cross-examination type questions? Are they hostile? <laughs> Uh, I don't know if I would say that they're overtly hostile, but since uh, the hearings don't uh, allow for any friendly cross-examinations, uh, the uh, kind of depends on who the questioner is. I mean, Hawaii Gas, I think, is uh, has been pretty pointed because they see their economic interests uh, possibly being threatened if the deal goes through. Isaac Murawaki, representing Sierra Club, he's been pretty punchy. Uh, Henry Curtis. Uh, it uh, can be counted on to uh, say interesting things most of the time. Uh, I, I think uh, the consumer advocate, Jeff Ono, has done a credible job, and I've been quite impressed with, uh, with Chief Counsel from the PUC, Tom Gorak. I, I find his, uh, uh, he's very methodical, very kind of soft-spoken. Of course, I know Mina has worked, for him, worked with him uh, for a number of years. So I, I'd say overall the, uh, the, the tenor is that... Uh, the parties in that room really want to continue to, to burrow deeper into this uh, huge proposed sale, which would be a very big deal in our state if it were to be approved or if it were to be rejected. What do you think, Mina? How is it going? Is it is it going well for Nextera, would you say? Um, you know, they've only had one witness up, and there's a lot of detail in this. So, um, I you know, it, it's just kind of early to tell and then what I've gotten from it is um, you know when you're going there the parties want to address a lot of tangential issues and so it gets off course sometimes mm -hmm. you gotta remember the purpose of the hearing is to determine whether Nextera is fit willing and able um, to run, I mean, to be the owner of um, the Hawaiian Electric Company, you know, and, and there there are legal standards for that, and and um, so, you know, it's gotten off course um, a lot, yeah. and uh, well, you uh, know, if the if the in, the issue is principally is this in the, you know, the public interest. Um, are, are they are they sticking on that, or let me put it this way: Are they covering ground outside of that? And and is the ground they're covering outside of that does it really bear on the issue, the principal issue of whether it's in the public interest? What kinds of things are being raised? Yeah, it's um, you know there's a lot of information already on the record and. And, and again, these are regulatory proceedings, so, you know, it, it, it's very structured. Um, what can I say? <laughs> are, are, you happy, so, uh, are you happy that you're not running these, these hearings, Mina? <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm happily retired. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, ha I'm happily retired. I'm unshackled. <laughs> So it's, this is a taking place at Blaisdell, I guess, huh? 
It must be quite. A, is it well attended? Is there is there a crowd? It's actually uh, the first day or two was uh, there was a fuller room. I say by by now it's winnowed out. Uh, there are a number of uh, interveners who just simply aren't even in the room who aren't bothering to to participate. So it's kind of to the core group, which could expand or contract depending on on who's on the stand. I think uh, one of the things that came out last week, which I find kind of interesting, is on what basis should this deal be approved or disproved, dis, uh, or, or not not uh, not approved? And uh, is it the do no harm, which would be kind of the minimum bar, uh, or is it uh, looking at what actual benefits would accrue? So a number of the questioners were trying to uh, push uh, both Alan and Eric uh, on that. Is it uh, is it you know should it be approved based on, on, on do no harm, or should it be approved uh, using a higher bar in terms of, uh, of benefits? Uh, I found that kind of an interesting philosophical uh, discussion. I mean, fit, willing, and able, I don't think, in my opinion, there are many uh, ways to challenge that, yes, certainly next year and, and, and FDL for yeah. Florida Power and Light are fit, they are willing, and certainly they are able, but uh, uh, to what extent uh, would the uh, benefits... Uh, to the ratepayers in the Hiko Helco Miko territories, to what are those benefits? How would they accrue? How quickly would they accrue? I mean, that's it. it's really a pretty darn complex equation, and you throw the politics into it, and like Mina said, a number of uh, efforts to kind of go off track and and get both uh, get Alan or more like Eric talking about well, what's your what's your knowledge of this Hawaiian word? Do you know what that Hawaiian word means? Do you know what the state motto means? I mean, that I find. Uh, Certainly on the distracting side. I mean, it's an effort to essentially try to show that that Eric and Nextera are these uh, outsiders, mainlanders who really don't know about the culture. They don't know about the history. They don't know about the Aina and so forth. And so I can kind of understand that in terms of trying to score political points. But I would have to say I don't think it adds a whole lot to the the record. Yeah, well, you know, but this is an interesting an interesting question you raise, and it reminds me of the discussion about climate change in Paris. You know, um, in Paris, the issue is, uh, can we um, um, set up a system where we can diminish the amount of fossil fuel and carbon by 7 or 8 percent every single year? Because that is the test for saving the planet. Uh, they've scientifically agreed on that. And the question is, you know, how do you reduce... And, and and the, and the the pretty much the understanding is that you can't just go flat on this. It can't be the same as it was, because that is not going to save the planet. Uh, and even a, a small reduction is not acceptable. It's got to be a substantial one, and it's got to be every year. And and so you, I get the feeling that maybe there's some of that in the air here too, with the PUC, that you know that we can't have uh, the same as we've had before. That, that wouldn't be acceptable. We have to have better. And uh, somehow Next Era has to meet some standard, I'm not, I don't know what it is, but meet some standard of um, providing um, you know, better utility service, uh, more renewables, cheaper price, all, all the holy grail things that we want uh, in, in its uh, you know, acquisition of this company. Is, is that in the air? I mean, are you, are you speaking only theoretically, or is there discussion points, you know, that are reinforcing that notion? Well, I, I think one of the questions that I thought, you know, that they were trying to um, sandbag Eric Greeson on was, um, do you think the HECO team is exceptional? Or something to that effect, and I can't remember who asked that question. But, you know, it, to me, it was deliberate in a way to create some kind of um, conflict. You know, and, and, and the elephant in the room is that we probably wouldn't be in this proceeding if the HECO team was exceptional. You know, so it, to me, it was an unfair question because if you look at the commission's decision, Look at the commission inclination. You know, basically telling Kiko, you got to do a better job. You haven't been doing a good job. Yeah. You know, you don't have a good strategy. And and then you know you put forth the question: <laughs> Do you think the Kiko team is exceptional? And so I so you know I think you know there's 
good bones there. But definitely this is a company that has been without good leadership and good vision for a number of years. And they don't, you know, early on they, they didn't understand transformation. Um, they don't have the right organizational or cultural um, attributes in place to deal with major transformation. You know, and, I, and I, you know, tying this into climate change, I think we, we see some of the same elements there. That, you know, we're talking about huge paradigm shifts um, that need to happen to deal with um, these monumental problems. And right now, you have people just stuck in opinion. And as, you know, as those who um, want to bring the issue to the forefront more aggressively um, do so, and, and mainly with, you know, the statement of fact of what's happen happening throughout the world that are major indicators that, um, um, climate change is happening, you, you know, you, you have about 35% just mm -hmm. in total denial or resistance. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, the question is how do we frame, the, reframe issues so that we can have larger participation and, and seek common objectives moving forward than just people being so entrenched mm -hmm. in, and, and no movement forward yeah well uh you know marco I, i'd like your comment on that too but uh let's take a short break when we come back we'll hear from marco and the question of what what really is the test here and what is emerging as the interest of the commissioners and the expectations of the of the witnesses uh we'll be right back hi i'm your host on think tech asia bill sharp i look forward to, to you joining us each Monday between 4 and 5 o'clock uh, when we film right here in our studio in downtown Honolulu. The show, Think Tech Asia, focuses on contemporary events in Asia, and by Asia we mean anything from Hawaii, south to Australia and New Zealand, well, west to Pakistan, and as far north as the Russian Far East. Clearly, this is one of the most economically dynamic centers of the world. Uh, and we bring you up to date on what's going on in a whole host of countries in this very vital region. We look forward to seeing you. Aloha. Hi, my name is Cindy Matsuki, and I host the show High Growth with HTDC on Think Tech Hawaii. This is the show where we talk about all things tech, innovation, entrepreneurship, and manufacturing because there's so many things going on in Hawaii and more people should know about them. So this is the program that you can come and find out about all the things happening in Hawaii. And this show also airs on the level 54 along with Think Tech Hawaii. And it broadcasts live every, every other Tuesday at 3 p.m. So don't forget, check out the show Tuesday, 3 p.m. every other week. High growth with HTDC. Thanks. Okay, we're back. We're live. We're here with Marco Mangelsdorf and Mina Morita. Marco is, um, uh, what shall I say, uh, the principal of um, HIEC, Hawaii Island Energy uh, Co-op. And uh, Mina is the former chair of the PUC, now an energy consultant under, what is it, Energy Dynamics, Mina? Yeah. Okay. Maybe just a bugger. <laughs> and, we're, and we're talking together about, uh, oh, energy developments, but mostly about right now the, uh, the PUC hearings on the next era merger. Very interesting, two Akamai observers uh, telling us their thoughts. So to go to you, Marco, uh, first, uh, we, and we were talking about um, what, you know, the flavor in the room is over the expectations on the standard to be applied, you know, whether it's legal or de facto, what standard would the PUC look at in terms of uh, granting or denying this application? So you had a question you wanted to put to Mina about her comments along those lines. Yes, and uh, the question was uh, where you are, Mina, at this point in terms of whether you're inclined, uh, if, if you were king as, uh, or queen in this case, excuse me, as Jay is fond of asking sometimes, <laughs> uh, how, what your call would be as far as approving the merger as proposed in a, in a forum you spoke at several weeks ago in Honolulu. You seem to uh, 
dance right up to the line and, and I think cross it as far as you were inclined to approve it. Uh, so I just uh, w- was curious to have you elaborate some more on um, kind of where you are right now. Yeah. So um, basically what I said is, you know, if properly conditioned, you know, this is something I could support. And you know, resolution of some of the major issues like the ring fencing. Um, so, you know, how do you um, protect the Hawaiian electric companies, the, the, um, the utility from other actions um, for Nexera Energy, Inc.? And then the other one that I find really interesting is the um, the B Corp um, proposal um, put out by the consumer advocate because since ECO is such a formidable company in the state that the um, economic social impacts you know are are a key concern. So while they not may not be part of the regulatory proceedings. You know, it, it is something that is of great concern to everybody. So, you know, what the B Corp is, is um, is having the right indicators to see the progress made in areas like um, um, community involvement, um, environmental concerns, social programs. Um, and, you know, these are the kinds of issues a lot of people are concerned about. So having indicators and measurements to um, to rate how um, the Hawaiian Electric Companies are doing under next era control will, will, will be very important. So mm-hmm. um, so that whole concept is, is interesting. And, and so I think the other thing that is important is what I call the intangible benefits and again the organizational structure and the culture within the organization and and especially in a time of transition and uncertainty and you know are the right um, uh, attributes embedded in the company to deal with these kinds of um, major um, transition and, and un- uncertainty. And I think with NextEra, with the culture of continuous improvement, virtuous cycle, I mean, I, those are elements that that would be needed um, right now within the HECO companies. Marco, what's your, what's your uh, take on this? Well, I mean, uh, first of all, of course, uh, the Hawaii Island Energy Cooperative is an intervener, so I, I don't feel quite. Uh, I don't feel quite uh, unshackled to, to the degree that uh, the Mina does at this point, because we're 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 one of the dogs in the pen, so to speak. Uh, I think uh, it's going to be very interesting to to see how the applicants' attorneys, uh, how the next year and Hawaiian Electric attorneys go after one or more of the witnesses provided by the consumer advocate, including uh, Ian Chan Hodges, who uh, came up with a number of the conditions. Uh, that uh, the CA uh, put out there, consumer advocate put out there in terms of, well, if this deal is going to be approved and you want the, C- the consumer advocate, the state consumer advocate to, to approve it, you have to adopt these conditions. And Ian was one of the contributors to that, and he was the one, if I'm not mistaken, to come up with uh, the B Corp, the B Corporation model, which has been um, very clearly rejected by Eric Leeson and NextEra as that they're not going to do that. And I would find it hard to believe that that's just a negotiating ca- tactic that they're going to back down at some point in order to close the deal with the CA. They're going to say, oh, well, we, we're going to go for the B Corp. I just don't see that happening. So yeah. I well, think... Didn't, well, didn't they affirmatively say, it was in the newspaper, didn't they affirmatively say that they were not going to entertain any other business model and they were not going to entertain, um, you know, the, uh, the, the sale or the split off of uh, 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 Helco? And uh, I guess that means, Marco, they're against your program. Wait, wait, wait. I caution, Jay, Jay, I caution you that there are two different elements here. One is business model and one is ownership model. Okay. They're, they're, they're very different. So what Henry may have been talking about is ownership model, mm-hmm. that they're not going to entertain any type of ownership model. Okay. And then on the... On the issue of business model, you know, 
new business, there's no one set business model um, that out there that should be adopted. The business model is evolving and evolving because of new customer um, uh, preferences, new technologies coming in. And, you know, uh, basically a decentralization of the utility. Sure, I wouldn't so, disagree with that. I, I, I agree with you. If that's a, um, an evolution of a business model, I'm sure that's, uh, you know, probably in the cards anyway. Uh, but, mm -hmm. you know, I think, I think that, um, you know, the idea of having a, a Maui um, county-owned uh, utility or HIEC in the Big Island, didn't, didn't they say that they were not interested in that and they would not do that? They didn't foresee that at all? They've, they've been very consistent from, from the get-go that uh, the next year folks have, that they consider this a holistic package deal and that they are not, uh, they haven't taken one baby step, one teeny tiny step down the direction of uh, materially breaking up the package and, and considering the possibility of a co-op on this island or a muni, municipal utility on Maui. So I think they've been very, very consistent on that for understandable reasons, and I'm, I'm not faulting them for that. Certainly, that's almost the position they have to take. Let me, let me go back for a moment to this whole thing about the, the test to be applied. It strikes me that if you, you know, there's probably a lot of legal gloss on this, but if you say we're looking at something in the public interest, and let's assume on a theoretical basis that the, the new company, the merged company, the acquired company, would, would do exactly the same thing as the prior company in quality, quantity, expertise, what have you, do the same thing. Is that a reason to deny uh, on the basis that it is not in the public interest? I'm going out on a limb here, probably because, you know, the, the um, inclinations of the commission is they don't want the same thing. They, they want a new utility business model that seriously considers distributed energy resources, um, more customer costs. So, you know, nobody wants, you know, status quo. So why would they approve a company that will conduct business as usual? Yeah, interesting. I, Margo, you have any thoughts on that? I mean, if it's exactly the same as it was, is that, you know, uh, in, in a business sense, in a regular regulation sense, in a legal sense, is that enough to deny that it, it's just a continuation of exactly the same company? My observation, Jay, I believe that the Public Utilities Commission under Nina's uh, leadership and now under Randy's uh, leadership have made, have made very clear that the status quo is not acceptable as far as the way business has been done, so to speak, at the Hawaiian Electric Companies. I'm, I don't want to... But, but let me offer so you this. If, if they deny on that basis, then by definition, they have exactly what they had before. Well, uh, it, <laughs> but I mean, uh, you know, Alan Oshima and his team, I think, have, I believe, made clear, at least rhetorically, and I think he's actually trying to, to put a lot of effort into to making this happen practically on a day-to-day -day basis at Hawaiian Electric. He's made clear, in my opinion, that the status quo is not acceptable, that the company has to change, that the company is changing. So I don't think the status quo, as business as usual, is, is acceptable to any any of the parties. So let me let me offer yeah. you this. I, I, I yeah. go ahead. It was go really ahead. Yeah. Sorry. It was really interesting because um, when Warren Bollmeyer was cross examining um, uh, Eric Gleason this morning, you know he was bringing up a hiko that the hiko that we we all know, you know, ten years ago when we were introducing renewables into the system and the, um, the, the reluctant recalcitrant HECO. Again, there are changes from my observation. 
there are changes being made on um, in HECO, more so under Ellen Oshima's leadership. I, I think the question is whether these cultural organization changes can be made quick enough to satisfy the, the, the regulator on their own. If HECO can do these changes quick enough on their own to satisfy the regulator and, and get ahead of, of, of um, these major issues um, to create a, a, uh, a, a more stable organization. So uh, um, your, your view would be is that to the extent that the regulators have put expectations out there, demands, if you will, uh, on the yeah. existing utility, then the deal has to satisfy those expectations and demands. Otherwise, it is not in the public interest. Yeah, yeah. And, and nothing less than that. Suppo yeah. suppose, the, uh, suppose the next era deal results in a company that can support half of the expectations. And so we can say that it's not what it was. <laughs> I love this discussion. It's not what it was, not exactly what it was, and it's not exactly what we'd like it to be in the ideal or in the, in the PUC's expectations, but it's halfway there. Our, our, you know, it's more than it was, but less than we would like. Would that be a reason so, to deny the application? Well, I, so I think, I, again, you know, you have to understand as the regulator that if we are moving towards uh, more towards performance metrics and uh, penalizing or rewarding the utility based on their performance, you know, the stick is in the regulator's hands to um, increase their their return on equity um, based on on performance. Uh huh. Okay. All right. We're going to take a short break, you guys. And we'll come back, I, I'd like to know, um, you know, uh, what do you think this is, you know, I mean, if you can talk about it, what, what, is, what is really going to happen here and how soon? Um, and I'd also like to talk about whether these endorsements that have been coming in from all sides, particularly from a variety of labor unions, have any effect on the outcome. So we'll take a short break. We'll be right back. That's Mina Morita and Marco Mangelsdorf. Hi, I'm Ethan Allen. I'm the host of Likeable Science on Think Tech Hawaii. We talk about why people should like science, why science is actually fun, how science is a dynamic and vital part of everyone's life, why everyone, every man, woman, and child on the planet should really know science, should love science, should be familiar with science. So it's a great show. People come on here and have interesting conversations with us. They tell us why they do what they do, why they love it, why we should love it, too. I hope you'll join us every Friday, 1 to 2 p.m. And, of course, you can see it anytime on YouTube. Aloha. Okay, we're back. We're live. We're back. We're live with uh, Mina Morita, Marco Mangelsdorf, and me. Mina, Mar Marco, and me here to talk about energy. And, uh, the, you know, the action of the day is in the PUC. It all rhymes, doesn't it? The action of days in the PUC, we're trying to figure out, you know, what's on their minds and where this is going. So I wanted to ask you guys, where is it going? I mean, we, I think we've seen a lot. Uh, we've seen a lot of the interrogatories. We've seen a lot of public statements. We've seen a lot of complaints. Uh, we've seen a lot of statements by the uh, interveners. Where is it going? What, what's your sense of it now? Is it going to be sooner than later? Is it going to be uh, built up with all kinds of conditions? It's going to be an outright acceptance or rejection. What's your sense? I'd say, Jay, it's going to be later than sooner because uh, unless the pace picks up dramatically, uh, it's, like as I was saying earlier, I think it's very hard to see how uh, the hearings will be wrapped up with all the uh, witnesses uh, by Wednesday of next week. And if that's the case, I have heard that it wouldn't uh, be able to reconvene until sometime in February. So this pushes, pushes out the time horizon uh, quite conceivably beyond what Chairman Iwase has said in the media over the past month, which is thinking about the possibility, the possibility of a decision by June of next year. And then the, the, the anniversary actually took place last week on the 3rd of December yeah. uh, that, that marked one year from when the deal was announced. And yeah. the parties, the applicants, agreed to uh, 
a pretty much uh, automatic six-month extension, which takes us into June 3rd. And uh, Mr. Gleason has uh, made clear in repeated questions, okay, what happens that June 3rd, after June 3rd, and there is no no decision, no regulatory approval, which is entirely in the realm of possibility. And his response has essentially been, uh, to paraphrase him, kind of all bets are off. And that, that's generated all sorts of questions about termination fee. When does the $90 million plus attorney's fees uh, play into? What are the conditions when, when Party A uh, has to pay Party B that? But the, uh, again, I think I'd go back to this. Gonna, it's, it's, happening. it's gonna happen later rather than sooner, mm -hmm. if, especially if the hearings aren't wrapped up by next Wednesday, which I would uh, maybe not bet the mortgage on my house this time, but it's uh, maybe a nice <laughs> meal at Longy's restaurant there at uh, Almoana. Mina, what do you think? Yeah, I, I think with the, uh, again, just uh, a lot of the parties throwing in all these tangential issues, it's going a lot slower than I, I think anybody um, yeah. would want. Yeah. But, but I, 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 again, um, I think it's too early to tell. I, I, I think we we'll probably get a better indication at the towards the end of the week on Thursday. You know, um, I'm I'm reminded of the uh, Comcast merger, where Comcast was going to, you know, acquire Time Warner around the country, and uh, that would that would make uh, kind of, that would have made Comcast, uh, you know, the biggest, uh, you know, uh, uh, entertainment uh, telecommunications company in the country by mm -hmm. far. And uh, there yeah. were, you know, there were lots of concerns raised about that, about, you know, a monopoly and uh, uh, mm -hmm. antitrust issues. And, and so mm -hmm. what happened ultimately is there was probably discussions with uh, Tom Wheeler, the chair of the FCC, and it resulted in, um, you know, a voluntary withdrawal of the application, voluntary withdrawal of the merger. But there's no issue yeah. like that here. This is, this is mm -hmm. you know, this is a lot of evidence, and some goes this way, and some goes that way. Uh, so it, it just doesn't seem that, um, you know, they would, they would drop the deal. Um, and, uh, but, but my question to you both is, what, what motivates them, Next Era, to continue on this track? I mean, we've seen some, some very rough uh, responses to foreign investment in Hawaii. We've seen the super ferry, we've seen TMT. Um, and others, and I guess the question is, what motivates NextEra to keep on trucking with this uh, and to suffer the slings and arrows and criticisms and demands and, and the $100 million in attorney's fees? What, what makes well, them keep going? Well, like you just said, Jay, I think they're, they're clearly well invested and, uh, you know, none, neither three of us are privy to the actual number to date, but I think $100 million, give or take 10 or 20 in the plus or minus side, I think that's probably a reasonable estimate. And I would think that the chairman of the board, uh, Jim Robo, and his board continue, at least as of today, uh, to make the calculation that there's still a reasonable possibility of success. Because if they were to, to uh, conclude the opposite, then uh, it wouldn't make too much sense why they would be continuing to throw the resources that they are throwing at it. So. Uh, I think they, they still believe that uh, they have a compelling case. And if you read the pre-hearing brief, which is kind of the pre, uh, b you know, before jury summation, essentially, that they made uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I mean, they, they make a very clear argument that uh, y you, as in State of Hawaii, you send us away at your peril because it's a binary choice, choice of the status quo, which you're saying you find unacceptable versus all the wonderful things that we, we think we can bring. So they're, they're playing somewhat of a game of brinksmanship here in terms of daring regulators to tell them to go home with their billions and go home back, go back home to Juneau Beach. You know, and there are factors uh, that are being insinuated into the public discussion. For example, uh, all these union endorsements coming in left and right, that's, and that's impressive. I mean, I wonder why that didn't happen earlier, actually. It's, uh, it seemed a little late to me. Um, the other thing is uh, that, the, you know, they, they're going to bring, they're gonna bring uh, executives from Florida now, put them, and, the, and I think I, I saw that they were not going to put local executives on, on the board of directors. And all this, all this goes into the, the porridge, so to speak. And I wonder, Mina, uh, whether you think public opinion on this is changing or has changed or will change because of these other factors that are in play. And also, you know, from the point of view of the chair, 
uh, which you, you know, you, you've had experience, you can appreciate. From the point of view of the chair, does it make a bit of difference what public opinion is? Well, I, I think, you know, first of all, to inject public opinion into this, it's kind of unfair because right now on, on energy issues, electric grid issues, the public is uninformed. And, and um, so people have been basing their opinions on, you know, on, on advocate statements, on uh, missteps by Ms. Nextera. So, you know, the only way to come out of this is ensuring that this is a good, well-founded regulatory decision which I think we're primarily going to rely on the PUC and the consumer advocate to make, because otherwise everybody else has a um, a special interest in the proceeding. So, you know, with all due respect, Marco, you know, most of the interveners are there not for the public interest, but for specific positions that they're advocating for. So, you know, to move away from a political decision, you're really going to have to count on the expertise of the commission in moving forward and the consumer advocate and um, for, for the best outcome. Well, thank you, and Mina. Marco, you want to you take a moment and close here? What are your closing sure, thoughts sure. about this whole subject and where it's going? Um, and uh, what do you want to talk about next time? So give us a, a moment of that. Well, and I'm going to push back on Mina just a little tiny bit in terms of, uh, yes, there's no shortage of interveners who are pursuing rather narrow uh, parochial interests. And, and we here in the Big Island, we are making the case for why we think the cooperative model is uh, of a superior quality in nature and to the public benefit for the 190,000 plus residents of, of the Big Island. So that's not the same as all three service territories of Helco, Hico, and Nico, but we are, our argument has been, our point has been since day one essentially going back to January that we feel that the, the case should be made, can be made for a cooperative ownership model being in the best public interest for the residents of this island. So, I mean, when we reconvene you and I and Mina, I think uh, we'll certainly have more to talk about regarding the merger and then uh, r what's going on in, uh, in other aspects of energy, whether it's the uh, power supply improvement plan, which uh, uh, we're waiting until April now for Rev 3 or Rev 4 of that from the HECO companies. There's also the, the battle over kind of the heart and soul of the of the solar community with a lot of uh, uh, crossfire going on in the past couple of weeks regarding some of the uh, the advocacy organizations, the uh, TAF being one of them, the Alliance for Solar Choice that uh, uh, Mina has been opining on a number of times over the past month. So, gosh, it sounds like just, you know, just as we're getting started, Jay, we've got to bring things to a close. We could go on for hours and hours and hours. I know we could. <laughs> and this is the biggest, this is the 1600 pounder in our midst. Uh, it stands in the way of resolution of so many other issues. Uh, but keep in mind, we will, we will have a show in two weeks. And on uh, January 22nd, uh, with Mina's help, uh, the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum uh, will have its legislative briefing, which is probably going to be more interesting than any one in the past. So thank you very much, uh, Mina Morita and Marco Mangelsdorf, for this discussion. It's to be continued. Aloha, you guys. Thank you, Jay. Thanks, Jay. Thanks, Marco. Thank you, Mina.